quantum theory and Einstein's general theory of relativity are the two great fundamental theories of contemporary physics. Between them, they provide the conceptual framework and the mathematical language in which we express all other theories in physics. And they provide the basic principles to which all known laws of nature conform. The deeper and more general a theory is, the further away it tends to be from everyday experience. So it's not surprising that our deepest theories involve some very unfamiliar counterintuitive phenomena, not least of which are the phenomena of quantum computation, the subject of these lectures. But in this first lecture, I won't describe any phenomena. I'll give an overview of how quantum theory describes the world and physical processes. And then I'll introduce you to the simplest of all quantum systems, which is also the centerpiece of quantum computation, the qubit or quantum bit. Quantum computation isn't something that existing microchips do, even if they rely on quantum mechanical phenomena. Today's computers don't count as quantum computers because their repertoire of computations is still the same as that of the abstract universal Turing machine, which was the prototype of all classical computers devised by the mathematician Alan Turing in 1936. Quantum computers will be capable of new modes of computation, which classical computers are incapable of, even in principle. The equations that predict the outcomes of quantum mechanical experiments are all uncontroversial. But what the underlying explanation is, what's happening physically to bring about those outcomes, is still very controversial. The various rival explanations are called interpretations of quantum theory. The one I'll be using sounds like science fiction at first. It was proposed by Hugh Everett in 1957, and it's called the Many Universes Interpretation. It says that the universe, the space we see around us with all the galaxies and stars and matter, doesn't constitute the whole of reality. In fact, it's just a small slice of physical reality as a whole, where there are, among other things, vast numbers of coexisting universes similar to ours. If you're new to this idea, and skeptical, that's good, but I ask you to go along with it for the purpose of learning the theory. In the course of that, I expect to persuade you that this very fruitful way of understanding quantum theory makes sense. In fact, that it's the only way that makes sense. Anyway, if there are many universes, we need a new word to denote physical reality as a whole. And that word is, instead of universe, multiverse. Our universe, then, is to some approximation a self-contained entity within the multiverse. This approximation is called classical physics, pre-quantum physics. And in computation theory, it's called classical computation. That is to say, Turing-type computation. As we'll see, Turing's theory is a complete model for computations that happen within individual universes. The quantum theory of computation is the full theory, which has the multiverse as its arena. In many physical phenomena, especially on microscopic scales, the classical approximation just breaks down, because in reality, physical objects aren't confined to just one universe. they have a certain extension across the multiverse. Or, to put that in another way, every object in one universe has counterparts in a range of other universes. And these counterparts can behave differently from each other, and they can affect each other. Such effects are called quantum interference. 
they constitute our evidence of the existence of a reality beyond our universe. Under certain circumstances, they permit fundamentally new modes of information processing, which we call quantum computation and quantum communication. The theory of computation was originally conceived of as a branch of pure mathematics. It has been incorporated into physics via the quantum theory of computation, which is now the theory of computation. The previous abstract theory developed by Turing and others lives on only as the classical approximation, though, as I said, that's good enough to describe what all computers currently on the market do. With the benefit of hindsight, we can see that the theory of computation always did have a lot in common conceptually with physics. When a computer performs a computation, it starts with some input information which it modifies according to definite rules which are characteristic of the hardware of that computer. So the output depends on the input and on the rules by which the computer operates. A physical system is, roughly speaking, some part of nature that could, in principle, be experimented on, such as this. Physical systems undergo motion, or change. In other words, we can pick any two times and say that the system has changed from an initial state to a final state between those two times according to laws of motion, which are the laws of physics as specialized to that system. Experiment and measurement are just forms of motion. They involve both a system we're experimenting on and some measuring instrument or observer. We find the system in an initial state, or we prepare it in some way, and we prepare a measuring instrument. The system and the measuring instrument then interact according to the laws of physics, which makes the measuring instrument display the outcome of the experiment. You can see that everything in the left-hand column here is a special case of the corresponding thing on the right. But you can also think of that the other way around. Any final state contains information about the system's initial state and about what has happened to it since. So the motion of any physical system, because it obeys definite laws, can be regarded as information processing. In this first lecture, I'm going to describe the simplest of all quantum physical systems, the qubit, short for quantum bit. To do that, I first have to explain how physical systems are described in quantum theory. The central idea of computer science is that of a computational variable or memory location a place where information can be stored at one time and perhaps processed and later retrieved. Classical physics has a very similar concept to that, um, a degree of freedom. The degrees of freedom of a classical system are the real numbers that specify its configuration. For instance, a point particle would have three degrees of freedom. 
because three real numbers are necessary to specify its position in space at a given instant. In quantum physics, the closest thing to a degree of freedom is an observable. Just as in classical physics, any attribute of a physical system that could in principle be prepared with a value that could in principle be measured is a quantum observable. But a quantum observable can't be summed up as a mere number like the value of a degree of freedom at a given time. There's a lot more to it than that. And it takes a while to get to grips with this concept. The word observable might even be misleading, since what we see of a physical object is part of a larger object extending across many universes. A quantum observable refers to what we see and its counterparts in other universes. And it contains information about the structure of the multiversal object. So the angle between these two rods which would be deemed a degree of freedom if this system were described in classical physics, is in fact a quantum observable. This protractor is a measuring instrument that can be used either to prepare that observable with a given value or to measure its value to some degree of accuracy. Let me call that observable theta hat of t. I'll always use this hat symbol or caret for observables to stress that they're not numbers. If I were to measure the angle at time t and the outcome was, say, 37 degrees, it would still be quite false to write theta of t equals 37. That's an observable. It refers to the whole multiversal object in many universes. That's a number. It just refers to the universes in which the outcome was 37. Strictly speaking, the measuring instrument also includes the light which I use to align the protractor with the rods. That's because for any measurement to work, something has to be affected by the physical system in question. And in this case, it's light that's affected by the rods and then by the protractor and carries information about them to my eye. For each memory location in a computer, there's a finite set of possible values that can be stored in it. For instance, one bit can hold two possible values. A byte, consisting of eight bits, can hold any one of two to the eight, or 256 different values. In the quantum theory, similarly, each observable, x hat, is associated with a set of possible ways in which it could be prepared and which could later be distinguished from each other by measuring x. Each of these ways of preparing x or possible outcomes of measuring x is given a distinct label which is a real number. This set of labels is called the spectrum of x and it's written like this. For example, the spectrum of the angle theta hat, measured in degrees, might be the set of all real numbers between, say, 10 degrees and 170 degrees. So the spectrum theta hat equals x is between 10 and 170. Now that's quite a big set in terms of number of members. It has uncounted